I sometimes wish my great-grandparents had been more risk-loving and more long-term in their investment decision-making. I try to remind myself of that when I look at the world today and the enormous improvements we've seen in GDP per capita all over the world. Looking at some of the large companies of today, it's even hard to comprehend that they were once small businesses. Many started in the late 19th century and into the mid 20th century. You know that H&M set up its first store in 1947 in a small town in Sweden and now has thousands of stores worldwide. One of the last emerging market frontiers is East Africa. Steps to improve agricultural methods are taken throughout the region and the population growth drives a strong urbanization. Take for instance Dar es Salaam, a city of 6 million inhabitants off the coast of Tanzania. It's the second fastest growing city worldwide, forecasted to have more than 70 million people by 2100, according to National Geographic. This creates opportunities for better housing, infrastructure, consumer products, distribution methods, food products, payment methods, technological applications, health systems, education systems, waste management, etc. One day, someone will look back at the growth of a large East African company and say, do you remember when we set up the first business in Dar es Salaam, Kigali, Kampala or Nairobi? How should Swedish, or for that matter, international enterprises and individuals best support and take part in this fast-growing part of the world? Can I do today what I wish my great-grandparents had done back then? A warm welcome to this talk on how large companies can contribute to economic development in low-income countries, with a special focus on the opportunities in East Africa. Thanks to video technology, we've been able to bring together a group of individuals to share their experience and know-how on economic development in East Africa. The goal of today is to listen to their experience and takeaways in order for other investors and businesses to learn about the opportunities in this part of the world. First out today, we have uh, Dr. Willebrod Sla. What can you tell us about the opportunities for investments and businesses in the East Africa region? When we are talking uh, of the opportunities for investment, let me first of all give you an idea that the majority of the population of East Africa are all agricultural. And most of the agriculture is a subsistence level, so very basic agricultural. But we would like now to see an Africa that moves into more sophisticated production. You know that uh, however much you do with agriculture, there is no way that you can develop. You can always survive, you get always something to eat, but development in the modern sense is very difficult with subsistence agriculture. So in that sense, I would say yes, there is a lot of opportunity now. When you are talking of agriculture, the first thing that we are thinking of is going into value addition chain. In all agricultural products, I don't want to go into the details because of the time, but uh, think of all agricultural produce that is available in the East Africa region. All of that can be uh, taken into a production line in a big factory by a big company. So I, I think that is a, a very big open possibility uh, if you think of 70% or above of the population being in agriculture. But secondly, uh, Tanzania and the rest of East Africa now, they decided in two, 2011 that they want to go into big industries. And this was a decision by the heads of state uh, of the East African uh, countries in 2011. And uh, of course, that needed that each country restructure its own systems. That restructuring has been going on, and I think now it has come to the stage that every country is almost ready for major industries and uh, for big uh, companies to start investments. Uh, that has many facets. It has gone into, into infrastructure. Uh, a lot of infra infrastructure has been built, which is very necessary uh, for investments, big investments. Uh, if you think of investments, you are thinking also of a big facilitator, which is electricity. 
basically in all the East African countries now you have uh, reliable electricity. Tanzania is just going into a big hydropower uh, scheme, which will be used basically also for the whole of the region. Uh, you are thinking of uh, communication. We have gone into uh, modern railway lines, both in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda is heading on. Uh, think of all other kind of uh, minerals and products that are produced in Tanzania. Uh, those products uh, and minerals underground, they don't mean anything if they are not developed into something that is useful for human beings. So in that sense, there is possibility for investment for companies, small, medium, and big. And I think for the Swedish companies, uh, the, 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 the model of SMEs, I think it's a very good example uh, for the whole of East Africa because we know, and I have learned something about your SMEs, that developed small, grew into big companies, and I think that is the kind of model that you want to see. Now, the most important, I would say, is also uh, East Africa is hub to the central part of the, country, of, the, of the continent, and as you all know, uh, Africa now has developed what is called the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, which started actually, it went into effect uh, already this January. And uh, this is a big area, uh, and, and you can understand the impact of starting a business for a population of almost 1 billion plus, and I think it's 1.3 billion to be more precise. Unfortunately, we don't have that history of long uh, traditional relationship in business with the Nordic countries. They are more in the, in, in, in the missionary work, but also they were in the development assistance and development cooperation. Now we are moving in our new policy, and I'm glad to say that also Sweden has a similar policy, and basically all the Nordic have the same policy. We are moving to what we call uh, diplomatic, uh, economic diplomacy. Now, economic diplomacy is changing the ratio, the relationship uh, from, from development assistance uh, to bring down the relationship between the governments to governments to the relationship between the peoples to people. Because development cooperation has got a, a, a limit. There will come a day when there will be a, a donor fatigue uh, and we will not be able. And of course, the donation depends on the taxpayer's money. So people will get tired giving out money. But once we start the economic diplomacy, it means it's going to be trade between the people of Sweden, trade uh, between the people of Tanzania. So Tanzania investing into Sweden, Sweden investing in Tanzania, uh, Sweden doing business with uh, uh, traders of Tanzania, and equally so. Earlier, we also had the opportunity to talk to Gunilla Karlsson, the former Minister for International Development Cooperation in Sweden who today is involved with the strategic work of the Global Fund and its work related to AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria as epidemics. We ask Gunilla how should Swedish, or for that matter, international enterprises and individuals best support and take part in this fast-growing part of the world. As you said, Pontus, we must better assess risk and have a long-term perspective and be curious about what's the world in the coming days and years ahead to grasp the opportunities. And of course, like in Europe, uh, a lot of problems prevail, but my point of departure is recalling that six of the world's 10 fastest growing countries in Africa and more than 50% of the world's population growth will come from Africa over the next 30 years. Can we compare with China? Uh, and the phenomenal growth and development as we have experienced there. To me, this is about timing and capacity that speaks in favour of an updated view on the diverse and vibrant African continent. The pace of change is impressive, not at least for us that has followed these over the decades. The uh, African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement will create the world's largest free trade area. We will have an overall boost in the African economy. The rapid development is concentrated on a few key hubs with an emerging, growing middle class as well as many talented people. So, what will be necessary besides the updated political engagement? I have three points for you. First, 
continued support to sustainable development, increased understanding of shared challenges like migration flows, pandemics and the role of civil liberties and the rule of law, capitalize on the existing relations in academia, business and civil society. Second, for entrepreneurs, like Pontus indicated, a truly great opportunity. Of course, it will include risk taking, but in the long run, the timing has never been better. The markets will grow and so will their purchasing power. Thanks to our globally connected and interdependent world, investments in sustainability, like waste management, water and energy will be an essential area to explore. And just like that we have experienced in Sweden in the COVID era, the investments in housing, well-being and consumer markets create a huge opportunity for social impact investments as well as profitable growth. Besides this, I'm also a staunch believer in the growing tech area in some parts of Africa, like for example Nairobi. And finally, and third, now is the time to fill the gap and unite. Africa has the talent and entrepreneurs to succeed, but limited access to capital, not least growth capital. I think the investment case from, for Africa has matured, the opportunity is there and knowledge really are there. Now is the time for the long term opportunities. We have also talked to Scania in Tanzania on how Scania is contributing to the economic development of the region. Specifically, we asked Scania, what are the thoughts and ideas of the large international companies present in the region? We support a wide range of uh, business segments here in Tanzania, uh, such as transportation of general cargo, transportation of fuel across the region, uh, construction, uh, distribution and agriculture segment. Uh, we are also offering the intercity buses and coaches and now we want to focus on uh, BRT where we believe that with BRT services we can positively uh, contribute to economic and social development of our country while being an environmental smart solution into issues such as congestion and pollution. The efficient flow of people and goods is crucial enabler of economic development. All this contributes to significantly economic development. We see uh, an opportunity in the construction of CNG uh, infrastructure and provision of services in uh, the RIT system. You are welcome to Tanzania. Tanzania is waiting for you. There is an abundance of natural wealth which offers a tremendous investment opportunities for investors in a number of sectors that I've mentioned, and many more. Welcome to Tanzania. Africa expert and economist Peter Stein has written the book Swedish Companies in Africa, From Slave Trade to IT Revolution. In relation to that, it would be interesting to hear what Peter has to say about what can history tell us about how international companies support development in Africa. Uh, they have a long history, Swedish companies, in Africa. Ericsson started its operations in Africa already in the year of 1892. And at the turn of last century, many Swedish companies such as ASEA and AGA ventured into Africa. And these were big businesses because at the turn of last century, that is the year 1900, what is today Southern Africa was the biggest Swedish export market outside Europe. The reason for that was that they made huge discoveries of gold in Southern Africa. In order to extract that gold, you needed uh, communications that Ericsson could provide. You needed drilling equipment that Atlas Copco could provide. And if we so, the bottom line is that many Swedish companies were very early on in Africa and established successful markets. If you go to Eastern Africa, it's in, you also have some interesting cases. To give you one example, in 1911, 
the Swedish consul general in what was then British Eastern Africa, whose name was Åke Sjögren, he started the Swedo-African Coffee Company together with an American partner. A couple of years later, he sold the land that he acquired outside Nairobi to the Swedish Baron Bror Blixen von Finecke, who is mostly famous for being Karen Blixen's husband. And Karen Blixen is very famous, as you know, from the film Out of Africa. And it's interesting that if you go today to Nairobi, you will see that the house where Karen Blixen lived is a museum. And nearby, there is a restaurant. Both these houses were built by Åke Sjögren. And let me also give you another interesting example, Tetra Pak. As you know, Tetra Pak was founded in 1951. The first machine it sold abroad occurred five years later, 1956, and it was to Kenya. And one reason was that the Mr. Uno Åker Hjelm, who represented a number of Swedish firms in Eastern Africa, was a good friend of Ruben Rausing, the founder of Tetra Pak. And Rausing was very interested in trying to develop packages whereby you could, in developing countries, find better ways to package milk and other liquid beverages. The Swedish Development Finance Institution, Sved Fund, invests and develops sustainable businesses in the world's most challenging markets. Today, I have Karin Kronhafer here. What opportunities do you see for greater involvement by Swedish enterprises and businesses in the region? One of the tools that we have at our disposal is the Project Accelerator, which uh, intends to create uh, more uh, possibilities for sustainable investments and procurement in developing countries. And I think that this is absolutely essential if we're going to deliver on Agenda 2030 and the Paris uh, Agreement on Climate Action. If you look at the Project Accelerator, what it does is that it allows, it's a grant-funded uh, facility which supports uh, state-owned actors in their procurement processes in the sense that it is building capacity to ensure or to, um, to procure sustainable, but it's also a possibility to conduct pre-feasibility studies, which means that the project accelerator comes in rather early in the investment process. It lays the foundation for what can later be a procurement or a sustainable investment. On the project accelerator, can you, it, it, what is it exactly and how does it function if I'm a business and I think this sounds so interesting? Perhaps the best way of illustrating how it works is to use um, the case of Abidjan uh, in, in the Ivory Coast, where Abidjan, the city of Abidjan, identify that since the city is growing, we can see that in, in, in plenty of, uh, of cities in Africa that urbanization is, is uh, an important driver for change. They could see that the public uh, transportation system uh, was not, is not sufficient to support the citizens traveling around the city. Uh, it is not kind to the environment or the climate and it's not safe enough for the passengers and it's very difficult to you have to travel for a very long time and it's difficult to project when you're going to reach the point uh, you're traveling to so in this case uh, the project accelerator could support the city with the pre-feasibility study where it looked at how could a sustainable transportation system what could it look like and how should it be implemented and that resulted in uh, the possibility for Scania to offer uh, buses to the city and it resulted in the city buying 450 buses from Scania in Abidjan. And now we are at step two in this where the uh, project accelerator once again is involved in analysing the possibilities for, um, for biofuel generation in the city and how could that actually, that kind of source be established. Now we're happy to have Jan Furwald here, um, representing the Swedish East African Chamber of Commerce, a rapidly growing organization with approximately 100 members, focusing on the growth opportunity in East Africa. How can the Swedish, or who, how do the Swedish large international companies 
contribute to the small, medium-sized enterprises in the local region? This is interesting. Uh, the, the large companies most often focus on their core business, which they should, of course. Uh, but uh, in most of these businesses, there's a follow-up business or a comp uh, complementary business uh, that actually will be a tail or a support to the large one. So one example, we listened to Scania earlier. Uh, one example is the, the biobuses uh, need fuel. Uh, and uh, Scania, don't, they are not in the, in the fuel business. Mm -hmm. So then you have to make some kind of plant established, uh, hopefully with Swedish technology, mm -hmm. to actually support this number of buses in the local area with relevant bi um, uh, biogas stations. Mm -hmm. This is the great opportunity of SMEs and other Swedish companies as a follow-up mm -hmm. to the large companies' deals, which I do believe we should be much better on mm -hmm. to work with in, in uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So it's generating externalities that spills over to the smaller businesses. Another initiative is MTI Investment and their presence in East Africa. Pontus Engström is the co-founder of MTI Investments, CEO, PhD and an affiliated researcher here at Stockholm School of Economics. What makes MTI Investments unique, Pontus? MTI was founded with the intention of scaling small and medium-sized companies. Um, my own research shows that economies of scale do not kick in for small micro-enterprises. But it's only when you combine talent, someone running the company, with capital, and then size, that's where we see economies of scale happening. And our investments in various industries have created thousands of jobs in the region. And as our companies continue to grow, there will be more jobs created, more, many more jobs. Um, I see immense opportunities for Swedish companies and uh, to contribute here with uh, know-how, with products, and, and in a partnership with the local companies. I have two questions. The first one is, what type of industries is MTI working in, in the East Africa region? At the moment we are uh, present in uh, retailing, uh, we have uh, presence in agriculture through a, a dairy company, uh, we have uh, waste management on the island of Zanzibar, uh, we're also building homes, we have some initiatives also in fintech, um, trying to uh, um, improve on that sector. And, and we're constantly looking at various sectors to create a diversified group with diverse, as, you know, the more companies you add in here, we actually diversify away some of the risk of investing. Uh, and that's the intention. And the second question is, how can I as a private individual or investor collaborate with MTI? So MTI is an investment company and we have uh, several shareholders from uh, um, all of the Nordic countries, not just Sweden. So, of course, if you become a shareholder, uh, you are taking part in this uh, exciting and very uh, promising part of the uh, 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 growth story that we see happening right now. Thank you, Pontus and MTI. Today, we listen to a broad range of actors who have extensive experience and knowledge from operating investments and businesses in the East Africa region. We hope that this knowledge sharing will encourage more investors and businesses in Sweden to look for opportunities in this particular part of the world. We would like to thank you for listening and for contributing to this talk. See you in our next panel talk on the growth of East Africa.